All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome back, youth scientists. My name is Dana. I'm a member of the education department at the Aquarium of the Pacific, coming to you live from Long Beach, California today. Now, today is going to be a really special episode because we're talking about something that I personally, when I was younger, was really, really interested in and wanted to know more about because it has to do all about with animal care and creating a habitat. And what we're doing today is we are talking about behind the scenes care of creating one of our exhibits. What does it look like to create a natural habitat inside of a window, right? To give you that view into the natural habitat. So we're going to be exploring a little bit about our filtration. We're going to be exploring about how we know what goes inside of an of a exhibit. And we're going to be exploring maybe some of the tools and challenges that our staff here at the aquarium faces. So if that sounds like something you're excited to learn about, you were just like me when I was your age. So today we're going to be inviting you to participate and join in this program, asking all of your questions, things that you're wondering and want to discover a little bit more about. We do have this live text number right here. It's 562-286-1838. And then of course, if you're watching this after our live stream, we do invite you to email us. That email address is live at lbaop.org. Now, Throughout this program, if you're texting us, remember that standard texting rates do apply and make sure you have adult permission before texting in today, all right? Now again, I want to hear your questions. Behind the scenes concepts can be a really wide area of, uh, of filtration and mechanics to talk about and I wanna focus in on what you're most interested in. So we're gonna be talking about one of our tropical galleries today, specifically an exhibit called the Tropical Pacific Preview. And the reason we call it that is because it's one of the first things is you see when you walk into the aquarium doors. And it's the preview to our Tropical Pacific Gallery. And so we're gonna be talking about this habitat, but again, I wanna focus on things that you want to know more about. So if you have those questions, go ahead, shoot us a text. We'd love to hear from you. Again, my name is Dana. I am joined in the studio today by Sarah, who's gonna be controlling what's going on right here. She's giving y'all a thumbs up. And then I have Cynthia who's outside, who's gonna be taking your questions, passing them into me. It can be questions, comments, concerns, compliments for our fish, right? Anything that you just wanna share with us um, and talk about today. So again, let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about the care of our exhibits and how they go from a concept to reality. So a couple of things, if we're going to design an exhibit, and the reason I was interested in this as a kid is I had my own, um, I had a fish tank. It was a, a freshwater exhibit or tank. And so it was quite small. And, and, you know, I was young, I didn't actually know what was going on. And now that I work in an institution like this, that little filter bag that I had suddenly makes sense to me. Right. And um, I'm actually excited to kind of talk about that. And maybe if you have an aquarium system at home, you might understand some of these concepts. And if you don't, it's going to be really new and interesting. So how did we get this from the idea of a tropical tank? Okay, well, first, we wanna learn a little bit about the natural habitat. What exactly are we modeling something after, right? So I'm gonna step off screen and allow you all to take a look. What do you notice on here? What stands out to you? What do you think some challenges were? And why did we build something that looks like this? Let's go ahead and take a look. So again, our main goal was to build a tropical gallery or a tropical window, um, a window into the tropical world, I should say. So to build a habitat, you have to select target species, learn more about their natural habitat. What exactly do we want to go in here? So you might notice that there's a lot of different fish, a lot of different colors. There's also a lot of species of coral. And that's a big key component to our tropical um, live coral exhibits, right? So the corals and the animals that call them home. Now, coral, like all of this stuff that you see right here, that's an animal, okay? So corals are tiny little polyps. Um, if you've ever seen an anemone before, actually, Sarah, do we have a photo of an anemone that I can show them? One of our anemones here at the aquarium, we're gonna pull up. And so an anemone is a large, larger animal, I should say, okay? It looks like she's scrolling through and looking for it right here. There we go. So this is an anemone. Right, and it's about the size of my hand, maybe a little bit bigger. If you were to take this and shrink it down, let's go back to that live coral, and then all of a sudden, all of these little tiny anemones are on these structures. 
Okay, that's called a polyp. And there's hundreds and thousands of them. And that's what creates this kind of flowing coral you see. And they are all on a hard calcareous skeleton. So this is what we call hard coral. All right, and it's what's growing on this reef here. Again, that's an animal. That coral needs food, right? It needs um, a lot of its food and energy comes from a symbiotic relationship with an algae. It's called zooxanthellae. And that zooxanthellae needs light. So you might notice that there's light coming from above. So again, we're learning about this natural habitat. Let's take another look. What else do you see? Well, when we're comparing, you know, when we're learning about a natural habitat, we think about the light, like I said. We think about the animals that call it home. Again, we have our corals and our fish. We also want to think about the water quality, right? If we were building a river exhibit, versus a tropical exhibit, there's going to be some differences. Now you might notice that the water inside of our inside of our tropical galleries tends to be really clear and clean, which really means there's not a whole lot of food floating around for these stationary corals to eat, right? And that's where the light comes in for that zooxanthellae and that algae relationship. So again, learning about our natural habitat, learning about what animals are in there. Let's see if we have any other live coral exhibits we can take a look at. Some other things we might need to think about are the relationships between our animals, okay? What animals do we want to put inside of an exhibit like this? And you're going to have to think about the fish, the other invertebrates, right? Are there any little crabs hanging out in here? Are there any little shrimp hanging out in here? You want to make sure that your animals get along. Okay, there's a lot of animals in this one. We'll take a look here. So again, the more you learn about the natural habitat that you're trying to build, the more important. Let's focus a little bit on the corals. So corals, like I said, they are um, this soft polyp structure that, or soft polyp animal that grows on that hard calcareous structure. But how do they build those structures? If we're trying to build a reef here, we want to allow them to have the nutrients and supplies to create that reef structure. And that is going to be the, uh, that skeleton I mentioned. It's a calcareous skeleton. Now, Liam wants to know, is hard coral actually hard or squishy? Great question, Liam. So hard coral is a soft exterior covering that harder calcium skeleton, okay? And so one thing that we have to do to provide uh, for this coral is to provide them calcium into the water. Ooh, we're going to get a zoomed in view, I believe, on a coral polyp, Liam, so we might give you a little bit better um, of, an, of a response there. We can see an image. So while Sarah's pulling that up, once again, it's a soft structure around that hard structure, okay? So just like this, these are the soft polyps, all right? And then underneath, it's built on that calcareous structure that we are looking at, and that's what creates the reef. But again, to, uh, to grow, they need more calcium. So we might provide that with the water. We're making sure that we have the lights, the nutrients, and the resources needed to grow. Those are the three big things that we want to think about. All right. Now, the next thing we want to think about, we talked about that clear, clean water. Well, how do we keep it that way? Right? Algaes and corals and all the fish that we saw in there, they're producing waste. And believe it or not, fish actually produce waste that can be toxic in, in concentrated amounts. And so we need filtration. And that's where a lot of the behind the scenes stuff goes, because we don't want you to see all the filtration stuff, right? So let's take a look behind the scenes to see what kind of stuff our filters might look like. Now, filtration can be broken down into three main groups. We've got mechanical, we've got biological, and we've got chemical. Now take a look at this picture here. What do you see that might be some form of a filtration? or a filter. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot going on in here, right? But what I notice is a lot of pipes. Um, these are pumps down here that's going to be moving our water. This is a form of mechanical filtration. Mechanical filtration is kind of like removing the physical stuff from the water. I like to think of it like, well, this, this is a sand filter. There's a lot of sand moving around in here. And as the water flows through it, Particles of waste or debris are caught up in that sand and the rest flows on. We also have um, ooh, a, a bag, just like a simple bag or a net. Those are all examples of mechanical filtration. This right here is called a bio tower. Now inside of this, we have something called bio balls. They're small little chunks of plastic with a lot of surface area. Okay, let's see if I have an example of a bio ball over here. Hmm doesn't look like I've got one right here, but my friends, let me send Cynthia out. She'll be able to grab a bio ball for us. All 
All right, so Cynthia's gonna go look for the bio ball. And again, inside of here are all those hunks of plastic with surface area that allows bacteria to grow on it. Now, at first you might hear that and go, well, bacteria, that can't be very good, right? But in reality, bacteria is what's breaking down the waste of those fish. And so it breaks it down from that toxic form into something a little less toxic that can last and build up a little bit more. So this is a type of biological filtration. The next type I mentioned is chemical filtration. Now, typically we're using activated carbon to remove impurities from our water. And that's what's gonna provide us with that really beautiful clear water that we are seeing inside of our tropical Pacific preview window. So again, filtration is what allows our animals to have that healthy, clean environment. There are some scenarios where you might have a little bit murkier water, right? Here at the aquarium, for the most part, um, we're gonna build our exhibits so that they're clean and you can see inside. However, if you were to go right off of our coast right here, you would notice that the water's a little bit more green, right? There's a little bit more going on. And so that's because there's so much algae in there, which is why our tropical water is a little less murky. Tropical water tends to be clear and sunny, like I said. And that's why the zooxanthellae, that algae, settles with perfect. You can just toss them in. Wee, bio balls. All right. <laughs> so these are our bio balls. Let's go look at our document camera here for a moment. Give you a better view. Remember, I said they're just chunks of plastic that allow, there we go, with lots of surface area to allow that healthy bacteria to grow. All right. Pretty simple, right? Bio balls. And again, they were in that bio tower. Okay, lots of surface area there. All right, great. So let's jump back to our, our window here or our, our behind the scenes view. Do you have any other behind the scenes areas? Perfect. So we're going to explore another area and see if you can point out some of those filtration properties that I just talked about. Remember, we're removing large waste. So that's going to be our mechanical filtration. We're removing some of the fish waste. It might be a little bit smaller. Oh, I love this. Um, that's going to be um, our bio tower, right? Our bacteria breaking it down. And then of course we have our chemical filtration, which is breaking down tiny impurities on a chemical level. Now this right here, this is really cool. This is called a protein skimmer. Take a moment. What do you notice? Oh, okay. So it's whiter down here and it's kind of more of a green up here. It's a little bit dirtier. What this is doing is water from our system is flowing in and then it's being pumped with air. There's bubbles in there. Okay. Excuse me. Now this works on our systems in a hydrophobic and hydrophilic way. Now when I say those words, what I mean is water fearing and water loving. Okay, so um, oils and fats, right? These are examples of hydrophobic uh, molecules. And as the bubbles, the air bubbles go up, the, uh, the hydrophobic molecules go to those air bubbles because they're like, ooh, get away from the water, go to the air. And then the bubbles work their way up, 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 kind of spill over. And that's what kind of uh, groups up in here. And that's why it looks a little bit dirty is that's some of our waste from our fish, right? So it's kind of gross. It's called a protein skimmer. Now we do have some questions. Thank you all for joining us, uh, scientists. William wants to know, I have two fish tanks, one fresh. Oh, wants us to know, one fresh and one salt. That is awesome. I never had a salt tank when I was growing up, but it's always been a dream of mine. Maybe one day. Uh, do I, uh, oh, do I have a fish tank at home? And if so, what fish? Well, I don't at the moment, but when I was younger, I used to have a freshwater system and my favorite fish were the little tetras. They Tiny, and so I was able to have quite a few of them. They're very bright and colorful. Uh, Valeria and is that Gyro want to know, do you have lionfish here at the aquarium? We do not currently have lionfish, but that is a tropical fish that you might find on a reef like this. So let's explore the reef a little bit more. I'm going to step off so you can watch this. Now remember, we talked about learning a little bit more about the natural habitat, right? So we learned that in order to build a coral reef habitat, we need clear, ooh, warm water. That's something that I didn't mention, right? Tropical is warmer. We need lots of light. That's what we're going to move on to next. So light. If I was building a deep reef exhibit, am I going to be putting a lot of light down there? Probably not, right? So rather than all of that light, we're going to build a much darker system. But most of our live coral exhibits are... Um, shallow reefs. One moment. So they're going to be shallow reefs. And so that's why this reef right here, you can see that light shining in. 
And the light is important in this scenario because of that zooxanthellae that I mentioned. We need to make sure that while our corals need food, that symbiotic relationship with the zooxanthellae is important to get them those nutrients. And so we first have to provide the zooxanthellae with a way to photosynthesize. Now what that means is taking light and creating energy, right? Um, or creating, creating um, nutrients. And so we're making sure that there's plenty of light. Now here at the aquarium, we typically use, ooh, my mic. <laughs> we typically use LED and that's going to provide the right amount of light and the right amount of um, uh, the correct size light waves to provide that opportunity for photosynthesis. Now Sloan wants to know, is all of our coral real or did you buy some at the store? Oh, interesting. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a live exhibit. So all of these corals are in fact live. We don't have live coral in all of our tropical galleries, so, uh, tropical exhibits. Some of it is artificial. Now, why might we do that? I want you to think about the size of our exhibits here. Our smallest one is maybe a couple gallons, but it can go all the way up to 350,000 gallons of water. That's a big reef, okay? It's our largest exhibit that we have here. Now, in our smaller gal uh, exhibits, it's easy to put our live coral in, okay? We don't want to go out and remove a bunch of coral from the natural habitat. Coral's not doing well. So instead, um, we have the few pieces that we've gathered from other institutions um, or donations, and we help them grow and thrive, which is why it's so important to have the right nutrients, um, the right water quality. Ah, beautiful. We're actually partnered um, with Seacore. We work on um, growing corals. This is both for, we do do some in-house, but we also help out plant it on a reef here. So this is an example of what some of our coral growing areas might look like. This is all behind the scenes. So take a look. You'll see some um, holding tanks right here. You'll notice the light, right? That's the important part right there that we were talking about to provide the correct nutrients. Um, however, like I said, not all of our coral is live. We do have those artificial reefs in our largest tropical gallery. And that's because we don't want to remove all that coral. We would be removing hundreds, possibly thousands of years of growth to supply our 350,000 gallon exhibit with enough coral to make it look like an actual healthy reef. That's where the artificial aspect comes in. The beautiful thing is it's nice and colorful, just like our, our live coral. Our fish still get their nutrients because we provide them with the food. And it's a nice, happy, healthy reef right here inside our aquarium here in Long Beach. Uh, now, Helena wants to know, how do these coral fish have babies? Good question. So our fish right here that are living inside of this coral reef habitat, they, um, the one way that we know our fish are healthy and that our exhibit is set up well is if we see mating behaviors or, or any behavior that we would expect or hope to see in the natural habitat, right? Um, if they are in an area where they're stressed out or they're not comfortable or they're not getting the, their needs met, they're not going to be exhibiting those behaviors. So they would reproduce the same way they might on a reef. It depends on the fish. It depends on their style of reproduction, okay? So that can vary species to species. Liam wants to know, do we use ocean water or do we make our own for the animals? Good question, Liam. So here at the aquarium, we get our water um, typically brought in offshore and we bring in thousands of gallons um, a week and it gets filtered just like we saw behind the scenes, but much, much bigger, right? On a very large scale. And it moves through our systems from the ocean. Okay, so we actually, um, it gets delivered. And then we also do have an inflow. We built it, I believe in 2013, coming right in from the uh, water next to the aquarium, but that has to be filtered a lot as well because that's also coming from the LA River. All right, so where were we? Back to the light. What do you notice in this exhibit right here? Lots of light. Remember I said that it's a tip, uh, we typically build our reefs to represent shallow reefs where we're gonna have the most light. Now we do have one exhibit. It's our deep reef system. And you'll notice if you come explore, uh, again, our inside exhibits are closed right now, but once we're able to open up, you can come explore our deep reef exhibit and it's much darker. Well, how do we make sure they get the proper nutrients? Well. We actually feed them a lot more often than we might feed our live coral exhibits because we know that our live coral is being taken care of from that zooxanthellae. All right, let's go ahead and put another uh, video of our exhibit going on here and we'll make some other observations. And we're going to move on to our next one. In fact, our next one, beautiful. You picked the one I wanted. Okay, what do you notice right here? So, so far we've talked about learning about the natural habitat, right? To build this reef, we need clear, warm water with lots of light. What else do we need? 
think about the fact that these corals can't move. They can't go get food. Okay, so something that I noticed, we're going to start it over so we can take another look. I mentioned that those corals can't move. And yet, do you see what's happening right over here? Yeah, the water is flowing and those corals are moving. So another important aspect to building a coral reef habitat is flow. Coral needs the perfect water flow, not too slow, right? Because it's got to stay clean from debris and it has to deliver nutrients, but not so fast that it breaks the coral. And so that is a challenge for our aquarists is to determine how fast or how slow that flow needs to be. Now, different species of corals require a different level of water movement. Some like it really swift, some like it really slow. And there's another challenge and something else you have to factor in. If I'm putting this exhibit together, where is my inflow, right? Where is water coming into the exhibit? Now, the coral species that need that heavier flow should be closer to that, that um, start. Those that might take a little bit slower flow, uh, maybe like to be out of the movement of the water, they're going to be a little bit more removed from that. So knowing where to place your corals, depending on that need. So one more time, let's watch this. I want to kind of highlight that area again, now that you kind of know what I'm talking about. A challenge I have for all of you, if you come explore the aquarium, again, our inside's not open, but you can still see systems out here. Um, our outdoor areas are all open for you to explore and discover. And you can find some exhibits that you're actually able to spot where the water and flow is coming in from. Ooh, William wants to know, what is my favorite habitat at the aquarium? Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to have to think about this one. I don't want to be biased because I love Southern California. So I love our, our, our kelp forest habitats. But... I think, so I, I used to dive here at the aquarium and it was really our tropical gallery that drew me in to want to dive. Uh, but one of my favorites, which I think it's forgotten about quite often, is our Gulf of California exhibit. And it is modeled after um, kind of a Baja down along the central coast, um, central coast of America. And it's sort of an in-between of rocky reef and coral and there's a lot of beautiful fish. That's one of my favorite habitats here. Now Sloan and Helena want to know, or oh, want to share that they have a seahorse exhibit at home and use bio balls and a protein skimmer. That's awesome. So you're able to recognize some of the things that you have at home and build off of that prior knowledge. Great job. Thank you for sharing. All right. So we've talked about natural habitat, right? We want to learn about what exactly this exhibit is modeled after. We talked about filtration, making sure that in order to have that clean, clear water that you find in the tropics, we have a way to do that. We talked about light, making sure that the zooxanthellae that lives within our coral has the light necessary to photosynthesize. Then, of course, we talked about flow. Some of our animals, some of our corals need heavy flow. They might be closer to that pipe. Some of them need a little less. They might be farther away or tucked under. Trying to figure out that layout of where these corals might go. The next thing that we need are nutrients. Right? So, of course, our corals need nutrients. They do get some from our photosynthesis. But what about corals that need a little bit more? Now, some of our corals are quite large. Okay? And we can feed them small plankton, mites, and shrimp. They're a tiny little shrimp creature um, that we typically can put in there. And they get pushed through from that flow that we just talked about. And the polyps, just like anemones, just like jellies, they're all related. They sting, capture it, and they eat that, that mice and shrimp right there. Now, what about, um, right, because they're not moving, so that's what the flow is used for, to spread those nutrients around. What about the fish? Let's take a look at a video that might have some fish swimming around. How do we take care of these animals, right? Are they feeding on the coral? Well, they might be. We do actually have one exhibit here that's modeled after what we call coral eaters, and it highlights some species that like to feed on corals. That's going to be like this one right here. This is our parrotfish. Um, and it has a, a handful of other species in there as well, mostly our parrotfish. That's kind of the highlight of that exhibit. And that's because parrotfish, you can take a look at its jaw here, those teeth are wonderful at crunching off some of those big parts of corals. Now, would we want to put them in with a live coral exhibit that we're trying to grow? Not really. So you'll notice that a lot of the fish we had swimming around just there, Sarah, if we can jump back to that, you'll see that they're a little bit smaller. 
And these fish are going to be feeding on those mice and shrimp, maybe some other plankton, right? Uh, maybe some other uh, zooplankton. Those are small animal plankton. Um, some of them are herbivorous, so they might be feeding on algae. In fact, this might surprise some of you. One of the things that we feed our fish here at the aquarium, especially when they're in our live coral exhibits, is lettuce right? Who knew? So lettuce and algae in the ocean share nutrients. And so that's why our fish are able to get that nice, healthy salad dinner, right? And so we make sure that we provide nutrients for the fish. And we also make sure, remember I mentioned at one point, making sure that our fish and the corals and the invertebrates in there all get along. That's one way that we can do that. So nutrients, making sure that our animals and corals are getting exactly what they need. Moving on to animals. We've kind of touched on this already, right? How do we know what's going to get along? Well, let's think about it. Are we going to put, um, are we going to put two fish that pick on each other? No. Are we going to put two fish that might eat each other? Probably not. Are we going to put one fish that is known to go around and eat all of its tank mates? No, we have to learn a little bit more about that. We're actually going to place similar animals that you would find in the natural habitat. That was step one, remember, learn about the natural habitat. How can we take animals from that? Put them together and make sure they're getting along. Let's take a look at these. Do you notice any interactions between these animals? None of them are eating each other. That's a good thing, right? That means they, uh, that our aquarists did their job. So you want to take a look at the animals that would naturally be found together on a coral reef. And then you have to consider if they're coral safe, right? Remember, they don't eat coral. They must be compatible with each other. That's how I was saying we want to make sure they're not eating each other. We want to make sure that they're not eating um, the invertebrates. We want to make sure they're not picking on each other. You also must think about their maximum size. Okay, now that's important here. Take a look at the fish inside this exhibit. Are any of them like this big? No, silly, because they wouldn't fit in there. So instead, um, we have various sizes in here. Now, some of them will grow. And if you remember a little bit ago, I mentioned that we have varying sizes exhibits here at the aquarium. Some starting out just a couple gallons, all the way up to that 350,000 gallon um, tropical reef. Now, as our animals grow, we are able to transi transition them into other exhibits. However, we're talking a lot about our home aquariums, right? And we want to make sure that we're not going to be buying a fish that needs a 50 gallon aquarium to put inside of a 10 gallon aquarium, right? So again, considering what kind of animals you're putting in there and what size and space they might need, right? And then, of course, we have to think about what is in there, that they're getting all the food, and we're going to wrap it all together. Now, we are wrapping it up in here in the studio as well, but I just want to touch on the last few things, kind of do an overarching um, review, right? So we're building an exhibit. Step one, learn about it. What are we modeling this after? Step two, making sure that we have the filtration, making sure we have the water we need, making sure we have the light we need. Step three, making sure that we have flow to spread nutrients around. Step four, making sure we have the nutrients that are necessary. And then, of course, making sure that we're filling it out with all of these animals. Now, I briefly touched on this, but the last thing we're going to cover is the fact that our corals need to grow. So along with those nutrients of getting food spread around, like our mysid shrimp, we also need the right kind of um, chemical compounds in there and the right uh, molecules for them to grow that cal calcareous um, skeleton, right, to create that hard structure. So friends, this was just an, in uh, an introduction and in what we think about here at the aquarium, how we make sure that our exhibits go from a concept to reality, how we factor in all of the different things necessary to create a reef just like this that you see here on the screen. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes. We might end with one more view at a behind the scenes look at all of that material. So again, we'll look at some of the filtration, kind of remind you what's going on behind this view here. Um, and again, if you have any last minute questions, I'll take, uh, Cynthia's out there taking those questions. I'll hang out for a moment to answer any last ones. Uh, that fine phone number is 562-286-1838. But as we wrap up here in the studio, also feel free to email us at live at lbaop.org. Thanks for joining us, learning a little bit about our systems, what goes on behind the scenes, learning about some of the challenges, right? And making sure that you understand the system you're building. Remember, this is what's going on behind the walls of our aquarium. So we do our best to make sure that it looks nice and pretty on the outside. But remember that there's a lot being factored in behind the scenes. 
Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday afternoon, you scientists. I know tomorrow at this time we're going to be talking about, um, let me check, discovering Earth. So we're going to be looking less at our exhibits and more at the overall concept of our planet Earth. So hopefully we'll see you back tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.